Okay, so we've completed our foundations for sociology and our research methods or an introduction to research methods. And now I'm excited to introduce you to our first substantive topic on sex, sexuality, and gender. So I think the first thing we need to do is have conceptual clarity in terms of what those terms mean. As you remember, we started out with the idea of social construction of reality. And gender would be a great example of illustrating how we construct our reality through these roles that we occupy, as well as the identities connected with gendered understandings of our personality traits, our behavioral scripts, and so on. So the first thing to wrap our heads around is that biological sex is very different from gender. And in our additional sources, I've linked you to the sexuality primer, which does a very quick but easy job of differentiating between biological sex, sexuality, and gender. Too often in our society, we conflate these terms, right? So whereas biological sex would be defined as male versus female based on fundamental differences in our reproductive organs and functions, gender is primarily social distinctions based on a person's given sex. And we attach appropriate physical, behavioral, or personality characteristics with a person's gender. If you want to think about how gender is a social construct, you want to think about possibilities beyond binary gender. So we take gender for granted and we have a tendency to think of it as very binary, even though in your generation, at least in smaller pockets, folks are talking about third genders or, or non-binary identities and so on. So there's definitely a generational gap with that. But I think the best way to challenge this idea of an either or about gender is to look at examples, global examples, of the existence of third genders. You have examples like hijras in India that are recognized by the Supreme Court as a third gender. You have um, the Zanids in Oman. You have Burdash in Native American communities. And here I have an image of Mushes. So mushes are more common in indigenous communities in Mexico, and they are considered a third gender, uh, pretty well incorporated into society. But I want to qualify that by saying that uh, mushes are more common in indigenous communities um, that have been insulated from global gender, uh, gender norms. So one of the readings that you have is by Michael Kimmel, who looks at masculinity, and we'll discuss Kimmel's ideas more in detail in our next mini lecture on masculinity and homophobia. But for now, I wanted to use Kimmel's idea of pointing out that gender really is about socially constructed ideas, not so much about our anatomy, physiology, because Kimmel's pointing out that in our daily life, we habitually judge individuals as male or female on the basis of their secondary sex characteristics, right? Um, so body shape, facial hair, breasts, and so on. Um, and we judge them based on social cues, the length of their hair, and so on, and not so much based on primary sexual characteristics because these are not visible to most of us in our everyday interactions. So I think that's again a great reminder to say that it really is about how we do gender. And the idea of doing gender um, is brought up by Judith Lorber in the reading I assigned, Night to His Day. 
and we'll discuss that in a second. But I wanted to share again this image of this man who is trying to do gender by dressing up in women's clothing and shoes and he's clearly not being very successful and I wanted to share this image because too often in our society this is seen as a joke right it's used in a derogatory way and that's something that we want to interrogate as well right why is uh, cross-dressing seen as something ridiculous or to be made fun of why do we tend to make fun of trans or queer identities and why we use um, it as a slur when someone does not conform to the uh, assigned gender rules, right? So it becomes an important point to look at. So Judith Lorber in the essay she wrote talks about night to his day. In other words, how masculine traits are constructed as the foil or in contrast or the opposite of feminine traits in our society. And so Lorber says that culture makes the accomplishment of gender invisible. In other words, gender become naturalized. Right? So we are all kind of left with this feeling that maybe little girls just naturally gravitate towards pink and little boys just really like blue or like trucks. Right? And socialization starts very early and is a lifelong process, gender socialization. And so the purpose of that is it makes this accomplishment of gender in our everyday interactions, in our identity, in the roles we occupy, invisible, right? Um, and it, like I said, it starts when we literally fetuses in the womb and continues throughout our life course. We all internalize and learn this social script. Girls and women, for instance, learn the script of helplessness pretty early on. In fact, some young women might, in fact, con congratulate themselves and pat themselves on the back thinking, wow, I was able to use my feminine charms to manipulate a guy to maybe lift my suitcase. And in those moments, you have to always remember, <laughs> what is it that you're aiming for, right? Which is why I always tell my students and my friends, like, if you can lift that suitcase, please do. Because how are you then going to argue for things like equal rights, equal pay at work, reproductive rights, and all these other things that really affect women's life chances, right? So too often we internalize these scripts without quite realizing how we are complicit in perpetuating those gender hierarchies, right? And I'm hoping we can unpack that little bit more with examples in our discussion posts and so on. So Lorber has this really great explanation for why is it that we should be paying attention to gender roles presented as opposites because she's pointing out that gender differences then lead to stratification. So anytime you see the word stratification, we're talking about inequality, right? So Lorber is saying that it's not just that men and women are different, right? Uh, clearly, we are all different from each other. Like you might be, again, good at skills like baking or childcare. I might be good at working with tools and so on. The problem is that gender ranks men above women. So there's a ranking. That's one of the big problems that lead to stratification that feminine traits in our society are ranked lower than masculine traits, right? And the second thing is that folks who do not conform to masculine traits or feminine traits are ridiculed, stigmatized in our society. Case in point, there could be stay-at-home dads 
who might be ridiculed. And women often face this catch-22, which we'll talk about more with uh, the next reading that you have with Marlene Fry's Oppression. But the idea is, um, again, that if you are a woman in our society and you decide not to have babies, you're stigmatized. You're seen as someone who might be selfish or just there might be something wrong with you biologically, right? So um, it's really important, again, to see that it's not just differences that we're talking about. We're talking about those differences leading to inequalities, as Schwab had pointed out in his book. Again, I wanted to share these images that I think illustrate how we do gender. And sometimes it's very subtle and hence it becomes naturalized. We don't even notice it. And to me, this image is mind blowing because this is the same person. And just the expression on their face makes them look really masculine in that top image and feminine in the bottom image. So in that top image, they just have this frown on their face, also the placement of the arms, the hair is different. In the bottom image, the hands are placed differently, uh, the expression is softer, and then one student actually pointed out the placement of the tattoo is different. Here it's on the arm, upper arm, and here you see it on the wrist, right? So it's very subtle how this is done. And then this image, I think, also illustrates really well that um, there's a lot of work that goes into doing gender and establishes in establishing contrasts, right? So, of course, these images are of uh, performers, right? So, um, we again want to be careful here and qualify that not all trans folks, of course, dress up like this, right? So these are performers, but I wanted to show you that women in our society put in a lot of work to look very different from men, right? In reality, men and women are very similar, right? So I could donate all of my body organs to a man, right? So we, are, we have much more in common than we are different. And so you want to ask yourselves the question of why this construct of men are from Mars and women are from Venus, right? What purpose does that serve? Okay. And because, you know, you, you're spending a lot of money on hair and makeup and waxing and all of that to maintain the contrast. Okay. And one of the things you have to consider as sociologists is that if you can claim that men and women are so inherently different, biology is destiny, right? And if that is the case, how can you ever expect equality? Nature intended them to be different, right? So if just biologically they're so different, of course, socially, they're never going to be equal, and that's justified. So in other words, the inequalities become justified in the name of inherent biological differences. And you'll see this kind of justification used for any kind of inequality, whether it's gender or race, right? So it's really important, therefore, to challenge this idea that men are just complete opposites of women. Um, the other really important reading that we had is uh, Marlene Fry's Oppression. So I want us to spend enough time on this reading, so I'm going to push this out to our next mini lecture. And um, I'll see you all very soon.